Becoming is also your self-worth, believing something in your heart before you actually have it, believing that you're worth a hundred grand a year in your heart before you actually have it, believing that you're worth a million dollars a year in your heart before you actually have it. Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another amazing episode of For the Love of Money. I cannot wait for you to hear today's episode because I'm sitting down with a friend of mine. You may recognize him from the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, Edwin Ariave. Now, Ed, Edwin is such an incredible success story in himself, like this rags to riches story, if you will. It starts with this extraordinary story of growing up and having to support his family as a teenager when his dad went off to jail, and then how it's all translated into his business success today and the way he thinks and the way he operates. You're going to get so much out of that. you know, Because today he is the founder and the CEO of Skyline Security, one of the largest home security companies in the entire US. And so we take a deep dive into money mindset and why $100,000 a year was his first goal and where that came from and how to raise kids in privilege as they live in Beverly Hills and and are on TV, and just so much more value that we dig into. And speaking of value, don't forget that my wife, Lori, and I are still giving away money to you. We're giving away small business grants to 20 businesses, two of them per week for 10 weeks. And if you're a small business, if you're a solopreneur, if you're a ma or pa trying to build a business from home, if you're the the two-person shop or the three-person business, and if you feel like you missed out on some of the grant money that was mess, uh, that was meant for you, and if you feel like you know COVID has, has really had a negative effect on your business, then you are eligible to apply. It's a quick two-minute application. I want you to text the word grant to me at 310-421-0416. And I will shoot you the link to apply right back. It takes you less than two minutes. So text me the word grant to 310-421-0416. I will shoot you the application, fill it out, and you'll be eligible. Every single Wednesday night, we give away two more grant winners. And I can't wait for it to be a couple of you listeners because I'm so grateful for you guys listening. So get ready because there's so much value that you are about to get from this episode with my friend, Edwin Ariave. All right, Edwin, my friend, welcome to the show, man. How you doing? Doing well, man. How are you? I'm great. You know, this is an audio only show, but if people could see behind you, I see a Lamborghini, I see an Aston Martin, and I see a gym. I have to ask you, of all those things, what is your favorite piece of that garage right there? The Lamborghini, just because of the journey that it took to to get that one. And I say not this one because this is a newer one, but the one in 2008, it was a pretty cool journey to getting it. So. That's cool. Well, we're, listen, we're definitely going to get to that journey. I want to start with some rapid fire. It's a fun way for my listeners to get to know you in a hurry. And if something really good comes up, which I know it will, we'll circle back around and do a deep dive. You in? Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. So I know the answers to this, but where'd you grow up? So I was born in Bogota, Colombia. I came to the United States when I was uh, six years old and grew up in a city called Huntington Park. Ah, and where do you live now? So now I live in Hollywood Hills. All right. And what's your favorite quote? I have a lot, but the purpose of achieving a goal is not necessarily to accomplish it, but to become the person that attempts it. Oh, I love that so much. Like that is the that is the truest quotes of all quotes. I totally agree. What is one of your superpowers? That's been the story of my life. Has it? Yeah, one of my superpowers is just I've always been a positive person. I've always been able to take a negative and turn it into a positive. Man, I love that about you. I literally, when I'm around you, that's the energy that you kick off, right? You're just a, this great, happy-go-lucky guy to be around. It rubs off on, on people around you. What's yeah. one of your favorite accomplishments so far? There's been so many. The first one was buying my mom her house. Mm-hmm. That was a huge accomplishment for me. It was my first why. It was the first why that made me cry. You know, I used to hear my mom 
talk about her dream was to one day own a house in Downey. And I remember as a kid just telling her, don't you worry, mommy, one day I'm going to get you that, that house. You know, again, I grew up in Huntington Park, which is not to be confused with Huntington Beach. <laughs> very, two very opposite. Polar opposites. Yeah, man, that's, we're definitely going to circle back around on that one. What an achievement. What is one thing you're challenged by right now? Hmm, that's a good one. Challenged by, I think, I don't know if I'm, the biggest thing that I get challenged on, hmm, that, damn, you got, you kind of stopped me on that one. I can one. help you. I can help you. Is it being a Rams fan instead of a Packers fan? <laughs> good one. Uh, <laughs> No, I would say, I think the thing that challenges me the most is, man, I just, I, I think I love accomplishing too much. I'm constantly, just time, Yeah, you know, I want, there's so many things I want to do. There's so many ways that I want to serve and it's just understanding that in life, you know, your, your wise will change at different times and things like that. But sometimes I want to get to things and I just can't. So that's yeah. probably my my biggest struggle. I hear you there. Two more quick ones. What's something uh, generous that you've done recently? Something generous. Uh, man, I, I, uh, I'm big on my faith. So I work with, with uh, my, my church a lot. So I'm, I'm a father of Christ. Yeah. And, uh, one of the things that drives me the most is being able to give more. That's so cool. the more I can do, the more I can give. I love that. We talk about that on the show all the time. And last but not least, what are you grateful for today? I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my children's health. You know, health is wealth. Yeah, you got that right. All right, man. So listen, I want to start by circling back to where you talked about buying your mom that home. And I know it was 1999. Is that correct? Yeah, that was back in 1999. Yeah, correct. Okay, so yeah. 1999, you buy mom a home. And mm -hmm. the journey from you moving to the US from Columbia to that mm -hmm. moment when you got to buy your mom a home. Tell us what that journey looked like because it's a wild one. Yeah, it was pretty wild. So two weeks after coming to the US, our home gets raided by law enforcement for suspicion of drug trafficking. That day, both of my parents ended up in, in jail. My sister and I ended up in a foster home. Mm -hmm. About eight months later, our parents get acquitted of our charges and we get reunited with our parents. And now my sister and I are thinking that this nightmare is over. However, the nightmare was just beginning because every year for the next four years, our home was raided. And hopefully you never have to go through a raid, but basically when they come in, they basically tear down the, the doors, guns drawn, helicopters everywhere, a lot of chaos. And uh, finally on that fourth year, they were able to arrest my dad and, and put him away for a long time. And the cops were nice enough to allow me to speak to him. And his last words to me were, son, you need to become the man of the house. You need to take care of this family. And my dad was my hero. So I took those words to heart and I promised him that I would. And he did leave us some money. But unfortunately, two, three years after that, we began to run out of money. And that's when we had to move into Huntington Park. And we found a three-bedroom apartment. We thought things were fine. However, six months into it, we started to really run out of money. Mm -hmm. So now my mom had to rent out the two bedrooms in the three-bedroom apartment. So now my siblings, mother and I, were left to stay in this tiny little bedroom that had no windows. It was dark. As you can imagine, it wasn't the best living situation. It was crammed. It was a little messy. I still remember roaches waking me up in the middle of the night. But the other thing that I do remember very vividly is that I, ca I became obsessed with making a hundred grand a year. So a hundred grand, that was, that was my number growing up as well. That was like stuck in my head. Where did that come from for you? So I only knew one successful person back then. And <laughs> that person was a car salesman and that's how much money he made. And he was living a pretty good life. So I just sort of related that number to having... A, a successful life and, and being able to have options, you know, so then I became, again, I became obsessed with that number. And I think, you know, 91% of our thoughts are the same every day. Only 9% are variable. Now variable means like your, Oh, there goes my daughter running across the living room. I'm driving, I'm making a, I have to make a right. That's a variable thought. 
a new conversation, that's a variable thought. But 90, so that's only 9%, right? 91% are the same thoughts, thoughts of worry, thoughts of stress, thoughts of achievement. So in essence, what we want to do is we want to take, essentially change 91% of our thoughts and take out the negative and put positive ones every day, right? And for me, that was very, very helpful. And that's why I said one of my strong, my, my biggest attributes is I've always taken a negative and turned it into a positive. But that's why there's people that live the same life every day because they're replaying the same thoughts every day. So every day they're worried, right? Every day they're depressed because it's the same negative thoughts. So if you can just get to changing those negative thoughts and turn them into positives every day, that alone, you're going to win 90% of the time. That's 90% winning. And um, the other hundred, and I also related that hundred thousand dollars to, it was a byproduct of my why, you know, it was a byproduct on how I was going to be able to buy my mom or house. You see your why are usually your dreams and other people. For me, it was first other people. It was my dad. I, I had a promise I had to keep up, right? I told him I was going to be the man of the house and take care of the family. My dream was also to buy my mom or house. But then also, I also had big dreams. You see, I remember ditching school all the time, which is probably why I ended up with a 1.8 GPA when I graduated. But I would ditch my junior year and senior year. And I had this like beat up 1982 Sentra that had no shocks. And I dropped all the way to Rodeo Drive from Huntington Park. And I remember just window shopping. And I fell in love with the fashion. I fell in love Love, fell in love with the women down there. I was like, man, people look different here. Um, I, I, I would eat at restaurants there because I, you know, I was 17 and I was making okay money at the call center where I was working at. And it just made me realize, it got, you know, it got me to touch the dream. I remember from going window shopping, I would go to Beverly Hills and Hollywood Hills and I literally would look at homes and I try to think, I try to look for the home that had the best view. Because I, one day I would say to myself, I'm going to live here. And for me, the view was a big thing because I grew up in so much darkness, mm -hmm. right? And at the time, I didn't know what I was doing. But now that I look back at it, it was touching the dream. And touching the dream got me out of the bubble of Huntington Park. Mm -hmm. I realized that there was bigger things out there than just Huntington Park. Touching the dream got me to, got my subconscious mind to find opportunities to make that dream happen. And, you know, I always tell people, don't be afraid to dream big. You know, your, your goals should be so audacious so that when you accomplish them, people will know they were so far beyond your own capabilities mm -hmm. that God's hand had to be in it. See, if you're always playing it safe, you're basically squeezing God out of the formula. Mm. If you only go where you know and you only do the things that you know you're going to succeed at, then you remove the need for God. Mm. That's why I've always embraced that invitation of stepping into uncertainty because it's in uncertainty that I know I'm going to grow. It's in uncertainty that I know my need for God gets heightened. And it's in uncertainty where he's always met me and it's there that we've accomplished some great things together. Dude, that's amazing. Okay, so I feel like we just accomplished about 100 different points together in, in about five minutes here. So mom and dad, oh, sorry, dad got arrested. You yeah. had to take care of the family at a very young age, 15, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And by the way, what was dad arrested for? Uh, drug trafficking. Okay, all right. And so dad's gone away for drug trafficking. You got to take over the family. The money runs out. Age 15 is really when you have to go out and start making hay. Is that right? Yep, exactly. And what was that first job? So the first job I got was working at a call center. And, you know, part of the why was the reason that I stepped into that uncertainty. You see, I was this 18, I was this 15-year-old kid with these huge dreams of making 100 grand a year by the time I was 18. And I knew that the only way I was going to make it was if I became a manager. And... Everyone told me, you're crazy. 
for thinking that you can become a manager by 18. Everyone's older than you here. They're more educated than you are here. And you're timid and you're shy because I was very timid and I was very shy. But that, that's why I always say if your why is big enough and you have faith, then it'll be easier for you to step into that uncertainty. Love that. Even though everyone told me I couldn't do it. And that's where that um, favorite quote comes, right? Of you want to become the type of person, not that achieves a goal, but that actually attempts it. And that's what I did. All I did was I attempted it and I went after it like my life depended on it. I didn't let p- that fear of failing paralyze me. And next thing you know, I became the youngest manager in company history at the age of 18. I started to manage over 40 people. And more importantly, I became the right hand of the VP. But you know, by doing that, I also, it, it, it uh, grew my identity. See, I think step three to winning is building your identity. So step one is your why. If your why is big enough, you're going to go for faith because you're going to realize you can't do it by yourself, right? And then the third one is you got to believe in yourself. And the reason you have to believe in yourself is because you could only receive what your mind can accept. So if your mind doesn't feel like it deserves it, you're never going to get it. So the reason I began to feel like I deserved more because was because at 18 years old, I didn't see any other kid at the time managing 40 people, making $1,000 a week. This is back in 1996. So my self-worth immediately increased. And I began to, des- to feel like, man, I deserve more. And then sure enough, I uh, three years later, ended up... I was now the manager. I was making about $70,000 a year at the time. And I'd broken a bunch of records in the company. And then the VP of sales comes into my office and says, Hey, Edwin, I'm going to resign. I'm going to start this home security company. And I want you to come help me build it. Wow. He says, I can't guarantee you the $70,000 a year salary that you make here with your 401k. But if you make this work, you can possibly double, triple, quadruple what you make here. And I always tell people, if you just have common sense and drive, you're going to get far in life. What was going through your head at that moment, by the way? Are you thinking slam dunk, I'm coming or no way I'm leaving this money? That's a great question. The first thing I thought was, well, this guy's making 250 grand a year. So he must be pretty serious about this opportunity. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I thought was, well, if he's willing to teach me how to start a company from the ground up, then this is my shortcut to college because I never went to college. And the other thing that it did for me is it got my, like I said earlier, my subconscious mind immediately said, this is your opportunity because there's this thing called the reticular activating system. And it's something that I'm absolutely fascinated with. And uh, in fact, hopefully the listeners will Google it, but I'll give you kind of a short, a long, uh, short version of it, which your reticular activating system is part of your subconscious mind. Now, your subconscious mind sees and catches all sensory information, but intentionally does not share it back to the conscious mind. The reason it doesn't share it back is, it, is because if it did, it would overwhelm your mind. It would overload it, causing it to go to sleep. So instead, your subconscious mind filters what information it sends to the conscious mind. And it does it by the way of the reticular activating system. So think of the reticular activating system as a net that blocks everything from getting into your your conscious mind. And it only allows three things to get past it. Anything having to do with survival. It's like if you're going to get sideswiped, you're going to see that. Anything having to do with your dreams, which is why you should have gigantic dreams, and anything related with your identity. So what will happen is sometimes you could have an opportunity that will change your life forever, and you won't even see it because your dreams aren't big enough and because your identity isn't big enough. Mm. So as I look back at the biggest decision that I've made in my life, that not just changed my life forever, but it changed my entire family tree's life forever, I can tie it back to the reticular activating system. 
because if you remember, I became obsessed with making a hundred grand a year. That was my, that was my survival, right? I had these huge dreams that I touched, right? And the third thing, I put myself in these circumstances that demanded more than I thought I was worth. And when I succeeded at those circumstances, my self-worth went through the roof. So now, even though a hundred percent of the people told me, you are crazy. Why are you going to leave this job that is a guaranteed job for this unknown? Because my bills at the time were four grand a month. I was paying for my entire family. This is back in 1999. There's a lot on the line. A lot on the line. But for me, this was my opportunity. This was my. This is how I'm going to get to Hollywood Hills. This is how I'm going to take care of my dad and retire him and retire my mom and all that. And I was able to retire both of my parents at 21 years old. They've never worked a day in their life after. Um, and this is back in 1999. But most people, if they didn't have those big dreams, they wouldn't have even seen it, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, simple example of that is like when you buy a car, mm-hmm. all of a sudden... You see it everywhere. Everywhere, right? It was always there. It's just never important to you. But now it is. You see it everywhere. So, you know, for me, building your, your identity is, is, is such a huge thing. And I want to just... Make sure people understand that because the way you build it again is by putting yourself in circumstances that demands more than you think you're worth, right? And it, when you succeed at it is when your self-worth goes through the roof. But when we examine, if something demands more than you think you're worth, it's going to make you uncomfortable mm-hmm. and it's going to be very, very scary, right? Yep. You just got to just step into that uncertainty and as long that's the only way you're going to grow in life. And the other way is through personal development. You are who you associate with and personal development will allow you to associate with the most successful people in the world. In fact, if you read books on some of the most successful entrepreneurs and you start putting into action their experiences, you'll manifest their identity and in a couple months, years, maybe even become them. And, um, you know, that, that's, that, those are the two ways you build your, your, uh, your identity. Man, I love it. Well, it worked for you because you bought mom a home in 1999. I've actually seen pictures of, of it in, in some of your, your stuff. And it's really cool to see. What did it feel like in that very moment? Oh, man, it was, it was again, it's, it's, to this day, it's still probably my greatest accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Only because she did so much for me. And, and also because I, would, I was at such a young age that when I did it, it it made me realize like, wait a minute, I, I could, I could do this, you know? And, uh, it also created, you know, I think in life enthusiasm is everything. Yeah. And, uh, I do these, these goals, I call them campaigns. Right. And for me, one of the, I say I got tricked into success really, cause not knowing any better when I first started my home security business, I went 10 days without selling. And then finally I got, I got the hang of it and I made $5,000 in one week. What I did that sort of tricked me into success is not knowing I went to an open house before I had the money. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the open house, I basically got a blueprint on what I needed to do to get my mom's house. And then I gave myself a 90 day campaign, if you will, or a goal, whatever you want to call it. Well, that goal, what it did for me is it made me surge, right? It gave me all this enthusiasm, this want to work, right? So I had the surge of trying to get my mom's house in 90 days. And when I got the house in 90 days, there was this explosion of enthusiasm. Like, yeah, this is the reason I stay knocking doors till 1130 in Compton, right? (laughs) What ends up happening though, is once you accomplish that, your enthusiasm starts to drop. So what do you need to do? Let's get another campaign. Mm. The other campaign, I mean, I was going to buy my mom this brand new expedition because that was her dream car. Then I went, boom, surge, surge, surge. I'm trying to get her car. I got it for her. Enthusiasm, explosion. Yeah, this is why I love my job, right? Because what causes you to act is your ability to think you can get a result. Mm -hmm. So the more results you're getting, the more action you're going to want to take, right? So then after that, my other goal was for me, I was like, I want to buy myself an SL500 because I want to be like Tupac. I want to be like... (laughs) So I went out and I got me an SL500. Again, surge. I was able to accomplish it when I accomplished it. Explosion of enthusiasm. And then that, that's been my life is always finding new 
purposes, but that drove me to, to just continue to want to work and get more excitement. And every time I accomplished something or goal, it got my, my belief level, my identity to rise up. Mm-hmm. Wow, I can do this. And you, you get to the point where you sort of start, you know, speaking things into existence, if you will. That's, um, that's what's tipping in your favor right there. And that's the muscle that you're trying to develop, right? Yeah. And, you know, I think everything, Chris, is a transfer of enthusiasm. Now, before you say to yourself, well, that's not me. I'm not a rah rah guy. That's not me either. Naturally, I'm a timid, shy type of person. But when you know what you're doing, where you're going, and why you're doing it, you operate at such certainty that your enthusiasm naturally comes out, your energy naturally comes out. And then you're able to transfer that to other people. And people want to do business with people they feel good about, right? So when you're operating out of enthusiasm, you begin to vibrate at such at such a high frequency that you start tapping into a part of your brain, a part of your body that you didn't have access to before. And now you become smarter, you become more intelligent, and you become a higher achiever. And now, because you're vibrating at such a high level, you're able to transfer that energy to other people, all of a sudden, all these people want to hang around with you because your enthusiasm level is so high. And I'll prove it to you that we all have enthusiasm. In other words, it, in fact, if you go to a kindergarten class mm-hmm. and you see a teacher ask the class a question, all those kids raise their hand. Oh yeah, like shaking their arm, everything. Like can't wait to yeah. answer. It's because they're operating out of certainty. Right. This is why kids are the best salespeople ever. They're always operating out of certainty. But then all of a sudden, you get to high school, no one's raising their hand because they're operating out of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And when you're operating out of uncertainty, your natural enthusiasm, your natural sales ability is just locked down. Mm -hmm. We all have natural sales ability when we are operating out of certainty. So, All you have, like I've always been a fanatic about validating my belief, right? You got to be intentional about finding things that will validate your business for you. So for instance, in my home security business, when I first started, I became obsessed with finding articles on home invasions, Mm -hmm. um, carbon monoxide accidents, fire accidents, sexual predators in those areas to build your belief yeah to build my belief and then i was like holy crap there's all these home invasions whoa there's just there's 150 sexual violators in this zip code alone so now when i went to people's homes my belief level was so high that it wasn't even about the money i literally felt like i needed to help them and now i was operating out of serving people versus i want to make money on people I didn't care about the money. I'm like, I need to protect these people. And that's why I became so good at what I was doing. It wasn't that I was this great salesperson. I just believed cold-heartedly on what I was doing. You're operating from that place of certainty, like you're in kindergarten again. Yeah, I'm in kindergarten again. Yeah, I love that, man. That's such a great reminder for all of us. Now, you've taken this and you've actually taken a step further and created a formula of operating out of abundance versus scarcity because it's working, right? You, you grew up, like you said, um, having to take care of your family. Goal was to buy mom a home in 1999. It's a true rags to riches story. Now you're all over the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Um, and we can talk about that in a little bit. But obviously, there's a formula to getting there and you've broken it down and you've figured it out for people. Is that right? 100%. And the thing about this, I've used this formula to attain everything I've ever gotten in my life. Literally everything. And the thing about this formula is that everyone knows about it. The problem is that 99% of the people misapply the formula. You see, most people wait to have to then take action to then become whatever it is that they want to become. So let's take buying a house for an ex- as an example. Most people wait to have $80,000 saved. Now, once they have the 80,000, they finally take action and they go to an open house and then they finally become a homeowner. 
The problem with that way of thinking is that it's related to having a bad relationship with money and it's related with having a low self-worth. You see, if you're always worried about not having enough money or not saving enough money, then you're going to begin to hoard all of your money. And then you develop a mindset of scarcity. And when you develop a mindset of scarcity, you're not going to want to touch the dream until you have what you need to touch it. And what happens is if you don't touch the dream, you're not going to be excited to outwork anyone, much less outperform anyone. So instead, you'll begin to coast through life, hoping that one day you'll have enough money to finally take action and become that person that is that you want to become. And the chances of that happening are slim to none. What probably will happen is you're going to get punched in the face by life and it's going to knock you down. And when it does, it's probably going to take most of your money, if not all of your money. And then you're left to start from scratch this endless, vicious cycle of trying to save enough money so you can finally take action and become whatever it is that you want to become in life. And that's what we call the mindset of scarcity. The mindset that you want to have is the opposite. It's called a mindset of abundance. And instead of becoming being the third piece, becoming actually becomes the number one step. The number two step is taking action. The number three step is having. Now, becoming is everything that we've been talking about in this podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Becoming is knowing your why. Becoming is having faith. Faith is having positive mental attitude. It's taking action before you have what you need. I'm going to repeat that again. Taking action before you have what you need. Becoming is also your self-worth. Believing something in your heart before you actually have it. Believing that you're worth a hundred grand a year in your heart before you actually have it. Believing that you're worth a million dollars a year in your heart before you actually have it. The only way you can believe something in your heart is by experiencing it. The only way you can experience something like that is by attacking your fears, stepping into uncertainty. And when you conquer uncertainty, now your self-worth goes to the roof. Now you finally become that person that you're supposed to be. Then what you do is you take action. Now, Now you start to take action before you have what you need because you realize that you're a money-making machine, so you don't have to wait for the money because you know that the money's coming on its way. Mm -hmm. Second thing that happens when you take action is it sends a signal to God that you do have faith, and now you cause him to act. You see, there's this thing called the law of reciprocity, which you get what you give. Mm -hmm. So if you want something, you have to give it first. So if you want faith to work on your side, then you better give it first. The third thing that happens when you take action is now you get a blueprint on exactly what you need to do to make that dream happen. Now, now what you got to do is break it down into actionable steps. And the more ridiculous you can break it down to, the more you get, the more realistic and the more excited you're going to be about getting it. Because again, what causes us to act is our ability to think we can get a result. So if you break it down to the ridiculous, now you get excited like, oh crap, I think I could do this. Then the third step is have. That's when you put a date on when you're going to accomplish your goal. That's where most people fail. They never put a date. So then it just becomes an afterthought. It becomes a dream. But if you put a date and then you declare it to people, because people don't want to look, you don't, you don't ever want to look stupid. So if you tell someone, if you tell your mom, hey, mom, I'm going to buy you your house in 90 days, and, I, and you give her a deadline. Creates like, urgency. Yeah, creates urgency, right? So now that you have your date, you go after it like your life depends on it. And it's that easy. Actually, it's not. I left the, the, the hardest part, which is <laughs> there's going to be a 99% chance that as you're going after this dream of yours, life's going to punch you in the face harder than it probably has ever punched you. It's going to knock you to the floor. And that's when your test becomes. That's when your test will become 
uh, uh, your testimony? Do you go back to being the same person you've always been, which is if you quit all the time, do you become that person or do you go back to that person that just says, I'm just not good enough to, to get my dreams? Or do you keep pushing forward, focusing with unwavering faith, focusing on the things that you can control? Mm-hmm. All the things that you can't control. Remember when I said, when you act, you cause God to act? Yep. He'll start putting the right people in front of you to make the impossible possible. But that only happens if you're continuing to push forward with unwavering faith. And I'm speaking to you from the heart right now because I can't tell you how many times I've made the impossible possible just because I just kept pushing till the last day, focusing on the things that I could control. The only way this formula works is if you have five characteristics. Number one is you have to have unwavering faith. Number two is you have to have massive work ethic. Number three is you have to have discipline. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing about discipline. The higher the discipline, the happier you'll be in life. The lower the discipline, the less happier you'll be. That's fascinating because a lot of people think it's the flip side of that. Yeah, no, it's... well, And the reason they think that, Chris, is because discipline has to do with a lot of resistance. Yep. Beauty of it is if you can sustain discipline, then it becomes a lifestyle and then it's not hard anymore. So when you can turn that word discipline into lifestyle, mm-hmm. you're gold. The fourth thing you need is perseverance and you're not born with perseverance. You're, you build it. Okay. And the only way you build it is by continuing to fall on your butt and getting back up and pushing forward. And then the last one, which is just as important as any of them, but most people forget about, is integrity. And it's keeping the promises that you make to yourself. Mm-hmm. We all know about keeping the promises to make to other people. That's, that's easy. Yeah. You keep the promises that you make to yourself because at the end of the day, that's what gives you confidence. That's what gives you your self-worth. And other than faith, confidence and self-worth is the most important thing. And the reason keeping the promises you make to yourself is so important is because your brain is made out of two different parts. One of it, one of them is your conscious mind. The other part is your unconscious mind. What people don't understand is that the unconscious mind is a lot more powerful than your conscious mind. So what happens every, every year at the beginning of the year is people have these big dreams and they say, I'm going to be the top sales agent at my company. And that's the first step. It's what you're supposed to say, right? The problem is your unconscious mind doesn't believe you. Mm-hmm. And because it doesn't believe you, it literally will block opportunities that will make that dream happen. Mm-hmm. And the reason it blocks those opportunities, it's trying to protect you because it knows you're, not, you're probably not going to do it. And it'll create these excuses on why you can't make it. And you'll literally begin to self-sabotage yourself into not becoming that person that you want to become. And it's your unconscious mind doing that on purpose so you don't even realize it, right? Because it doesn't want you to get hurt. So the key is, now that you know that, is to start stacking small little wins of the promises that you make. So no matter how big, no matter how small the promise, you keep it. And every time you keep it, your unconscious mind starts to rise up and it starts to say, hey, when this guy says something, he means it. And when you can get your conscious mind to meet your conscious mind, that's when you literally start to speak things into existence. You'll start attracting everything to make all those dreams happen. Wow, dude, listen, you're giving us so many gifts. This is like an entire college education around how to pick yourself up by the bootstraps and have confidence to operate from a place of of certainty. And and like, I love how you break things down step by step by step by step. What of all these traits that you shared with us, what do you think the number one trait is that has allowed you to build this massive security company that, what'd you guys do? $40 million a couple of years ago, something crazy like that? Yeah. So in, in the last 21 years, we've made, generated 350 million. Wow. We'll probably make that in the next three years. So okay. it took me one years to build. We'll probably do in the three years just because, you know, it's a compound. So of- what's the one trait that is allowing you to, to make this happen? 
I've always had that big why. Mm-hmm. I've always it's, it's a combination of the three things, right? The big why, which uh, which then is followed by the faith. Because if I didn't have the faith, I probably wouldn't step into that uncertainty, right? That allows me to take on these big dreams. But you know what I can tell you though is the keeping the promises that you make to yourself is huge, yeah. and truly going after what your self limiting beliefs are that are part of your unconscious mind. And I'm just going to give you an example. So in 2016, in 2015, I made this declaration to the entire company that we were going to be this hundred million dollar a year company. Mm -hmm. The problem was that my unconscious mind didn't believe it. Ah. So it started to block opportunities um, that, that would make that dream happen. Right. And it wasn't until, and, as you can imagine, I started going on a downward spiral. The company started going on a downward spiral. And it wasn't until I attacked my biggest fear in life, which was that I wasn't very smart. You see, the school system, when I grew up, made me believe that because of my inability to pass good pass grades and my inability, I'm sorry, my, my inability to pass a test and my inability to get good grades, I just thought I wasn't very, very smart. So for years, I was able to suppress that feeling by just making myself believe believe that as long as I outworked everybody and I had integrity and I had perseverance and faith, I would eventually beat people out. Mm-hmm. And 17 years, that's exactly what I did. I beat people out yeah. until I finally surpassed what I thought I was worth. Mm-hmm. You see, I finally got to the point where I was like, wait a minute, I'm not smart enough to run this company. I'm hiring people that are way smarter than I am. And they're going to find out that I'm really not that smart. And it wasn't until I attacked that fear and I attacked it by picking up a book for the first time in 25 years. It was the first book that I picked up since Charlotte's Web. And what book was it? It was 10X by Grant Cardone. Uh, sure. And I picked up that book. And at first I tried reading it. And I realized I couldn't retain any of the information. I, I didn't understand what I was reading. So then I got the audio. And then I realized I couldn't retain that either. Not paying attention. Yeah. So then I literally had to write out almost the entire book. Dang. So when I wrote it out, because I was just determined, I need to beat this. Yeah. When I wrote it out, I was like, holy crap, everything that Grant's talking about, I've experienced. Mm-hmm. I've done it. Yeah. I know how to articulate it. Yeah. So everything I, everything I just told you about on this podcast, I reversed engineered. If you would have asked me these questions three and a half years ago, you know what I would have said to you, Chris? I work hard. Yeah. It's not until you sit down and reverse engineer, like say, wait a second, what am I really doing that gets me from A to B to C to D? Right? Exactly. And it was... So then I'm like, wait a minute, everything that Grant talked about, I've experienced, right? And then I made a commitment to study on my... to, to study for an hour a day, every day, no matter what. And then I started studying people like uh, Ed Milet Mm -hmm. and guys that were worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And all of them were talking about things that I had already experienced. So because I had already experienced it, my unconscious mind started to rise up. And now it was lining up with what my conscious mind was saying. And this is the crazy part. Guess what happens in 2017? I get a C-level executive that was running a billion dollar company, give me a call, say, hey, I love what you're doing. I love the industry you're in. I think I can help you out. He calls me and now he's my president and he's been an absolute game changer. And now we're on a trajectory to just blow past all those goals that I first had. Then that year, I get Grant Cardone call me to come out on his podcast. Uh There, Ed Milet liked it so much that then I go on Ed Milet's podcast and so on, right? And then I spoke with you at that Kobe Bryant event yep. as well. Yep. Relentless. And um, and then that, that year, uh, Real Housewives of Beverly Hills calls us and asks us, you know, they tell us that we booked the show. Wow. So, and that's opened up so many opportunities in business for, what, for me as well that, again, when your unconscious mind rises up and meets what your conscious mind is saying... You literally attract everything. And my entire life, I attracted everything I've always wanted until I finally surpassed what I thought I was worth. Because again, you can only receive what your mind can accept. Yeah. 
your mind can't accept it anymore, you're never going to get it. Dude, so good. So you just mentioned the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, and and for those that are listening that don't know, you know, you're married to Teddy Mellencamp. Uh, she's one of the stars of the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. What's it like to be on TV all the time? And and better yet, more applicable. What's it like to be married to another hard charging, high accomplishing individual while trying to keep your individual goals afloat? How do you guys make it all happen? Yeah, no, we love it. I, we we both inspire each other. I mean, she inspires me all the time, just with all the things. I mean, she's she takes on the mother role, which that alone is a full time job. And then she's got to do this show that is not easy to do. In fact, I give a lot of credit to those women that are on the show because you have to be witty yeah. and you have to be able to like come back quick. Yeah, I am not one of those people. <laughs> I'm like one. I'm like on a 30 second delay. You know, yeah. I'm not actually witty unless I know what I'm doing, where I'm going, sure. and why. I'm Operating from that certainty again. That certainty, right? But I'm not naturally a confident person. In fact, before I go on stages and stuff like that, I have to prepare like none other. Mm-hmm. If I go unprepared into a into a meeting, I I, I shell up, right? Mm-hmm. And I operate off that uncertainty and. My tonality is not the same. Yeah. It's, it's just different. And that's why I'm such a big... Now, some people don't need that. Like my wife, you, she doesn't have to prepare. She sure. could literally get on your show and just wing it. So I got So question, like being on a show like that, does it help your business, hurt your business, make it more complicated, make it easier? It helps your business if you're operating with integrity. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're always just looking to find any little issue with your business to make it a big deal. I mean, that's what, that's what sells, right? Is, is having some drama. So you have to be in, you know, you just have to do, you have to operate off integrity, which for me, that's the way I've always operated. My success has been a trip. I attribute a lot of my success to just being a man about truth, right? It, when you're trying to do something, when you're about truth, you're going to be around for a long time. Mm-hmm. If you're, scamming people, you might make money short term, but eventually it'll never last. You are. Yep. It'll never last, right? So sometimes going the route of truth takes you longer. Yep. You'll be around for a long time and you make decent money for a long time, it becomes a lot of money. You know, you you've talked a lot about money so far. We talk a lot about money on this show. And you're the father of three beautiful children. You're a great dad. And these yeah, kids are right. growing up in this Beverly Hills life. I mean literally a made for TV Beverly Hills life. Yeah. How do you want your three kids to grow up viewing money and success? So money for me is just, it gives people options. Money become, it just amplifies who you are, mm-hmm. right? So if you're a person of greed, you just become a greedier person, right? If, if you're a person that doesn't respect people, you just definitely won't respect more people. I mean, you'll, you'll just disrespect the, the whole world, right? For me, the most important thing for my kids is that they have a good heart and that they serve others first. And my my daughter had this accident uh, two days ago. She, not to give you too much detail, but she ampu- amputated half of her finger. Oh. Uh, the door smashed on her uh, on her little finger. I think everything's going to be bad. It be, be good. It looks like they're gonna, they were able to sew the... Oh, man, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. It was, um, it was hard to deal with. But the first thing, as the paramedics come in, and she does all this chaos because I'm like, my wife's going a little cray cray. I'm going a little cray cray, like the daughter, you know, her finger, right? And like I said, I think they were able to sew it back. We'll find out in two weeks. But her first thing to the paramedics were, thank you for helping me. Wow. Gratitude. I'm, pain, I'm crying. It's just, you know, thank you for helping me. And one of the things that I, that I teach my kids is gratitude won't change your current situation. Mm-hmm but it will change your heart. Yeah. And when you have gratitude in your heart, you can't be worried. You can't be angry. When you have gratitude in your heart, you're going to want to add value to people. When you have gratitude and love in your heart, you're going to want to add value to people and you're going to serve people first. And then you're going to be able to influence them. And then you're going to be able to lead them. And then you could create positive impact. Man. But again, that had to be back. cool for you as a father to see her coming from this place of gratitude like that. Yeah, no, it melted my heart because I was just like, this has to be the bravest child on earth. 
And again, with all that chaos, her bone just being out there, <laughs> uh, the flesh is gone. And the first thing she says is, thank you for helping me with this like choked up voice, yeah. you know? Amazing. Uh, I was just like, that, that's what it's all about. Well, you guys are doing such a great job with those children. It, it doesn't surprise me one bit at all. So where can we follow you? Where can we find you? Where can we plug into you? Yeah, so you can follow me at Ted Winator. So Instagram is probably the best place to find me. That's T E D W I N Ted Win. Uh, I'll put the link on the on the show notes. Don't worry You're about that. On for me. And then uh, yeah, that's that's where you guys can find me. All right, awesome, love it. Okay, man. Last question for you. Give me yeah. a reason why people should be unapologetic about their pursuit of success. Oh, I love that question. The, the reason you... Because the pursuit of greatness is your biggest act of service. Mm. That's how you're going to be able to inspire a lot of people. Dude, right? I freaking love that. You are so spot on. Listen, all I'm going to st- give you another quote that I love, by the way. Yeah, what is it? If you live for yourself, you can settle for less. If you live for others, it'll require all of who you are. See, it's like, isn't that so true? Don't you ever notice you'll run through a wall for other people, and, and when it comes to yourself, you'll kind of cut, you know, cut short here, cut short there. Isn't that crazy? One hundred percent. That's amazing. I love that. Like, what a great way to put a bow on this is. It's all about living for somebody else, and then the the side effect is that you show up your best self when you're doing things for other people, and that's where the success comes from. One hundred percent. That's I love that's- it, man. Listen, dude, thank you so much for your time. I, you're, the way you break things down, I love it. The way you teach, I love it. The way you give the steps and the formulas, I love it. Because it's real actionable stuff that people can take. And so on behalf of everyone listening, and of course me, thank you a million times over for being on. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm a big fan of what you and Lori do for so many people and you're constantly adding value to people. So it means the world to me that you guys are about people first. So that's why I wanted to get on the show and hopefully do the same for you guys. You certainly did, man. Totally appreciate it. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.